Well, hello and welcome everyone. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, one of my favorite stories, but it's also a story that if you get interested in um, things like studying the Makashikan and stuff like that, uh, you will see this story cited several times when we're discussing the notion of right views and then sometimes also in the context of discussing faith in Buddhism. So to get started, um, the source that I pulled this story from is the Da Ji Du Lun in Chinese, the Maha Prajna Paramita Shastra, or translated the commentary on the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And this is a large several volume text that was written by uh, Nagarjuna. And basically it's what it says. He takes the Prajna Paramita Sutra in 25,000 lines and he developed a commentary but this commentary is so detailed that many have described it as being basically a Mahayana Buddhist encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, this is your text. Mm -hmm. So the more you look at uh, other writings, meditation texts, doctrinal texts, you'll see this text cited a lot. And the particular part that we're looking at is actually from the introduction. And it's kind of traditional that when you have one of these commentaries, the first question is, why was the sutra taught? And so, in an attempt to explain that, uh, Nagarjuna sets up a series of questions that he then answers. And... Uh, excuse me. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but mm -hmm. for people who don't know, who's Nagarjuna? Ah, yeah. And who is... Who is uh, who, uh, I was thinking about the other person you were mentioning, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, that's a good question. Uh, Nagarjuna wrote several uh, commentaries, and he's best known as uh, the sort of de facto founder of the Middle Way School, or the Madhyamaka School, which isn't really like a set school so much as a trend of thought. And so he was very interested in the Prajnaparamita Sutras, and legend has it that he actually was the person who recovered them from the Nagas, which are sort of uh, analog to dragons. <clears throat> so, uh, with that in mind, he wrote uh, several really large commentaries, and in East Asian Buddhism, at least, he's considered a very authoritative figure to look to for exegetical works. And we actually don't know the extent uh, of the works that are attributed to him, uh, which one of those were actually authored by the historical personage, but we are fairly certain about a few. So this is probably one of the more famous ones, aside from the verses on the middle way, or the Mula Majamaka Karika, which explores emptiness in depth. So while he's trying to establish the purpose of why the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras were taught, uh, this is the question that he sets up to answer. If the views are false, and this is meaning our conventional understanding of reality, then what's the absolute point of view? Because the whole purpose of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras is to get us in touch with this notion of the absolute, what's beyond our sort of limited human understanding. Well. Nagarjuna always leads off with the most complicated answer, and the philosophy behind that is, if somebody is really, uh, I guess, well-versed in all of this sort of theory, then they could just read that answer and move on. And then he continues to explain with more and more detail as he goes. So his initial answer is, it is the path that transcends all discourse, the arrest and destruction of the functioning of the mind, the absence of any support, the non-declaration of the dharmas, or phenomena, the true nature of the dharmas, the absence of beginning, middle, and end, indestructibility, and inalterability. And that's probably not too helpful for most of us. It's pretty much like you're reading a statement from the Prajnaparamita Sutra itself. But the basic thrust of this is that we're trying to understand what the world is like beyond the human point of view of understanding it. And so in that sense, saying that it's the path that transcends all discourse implies that we're trying to sort of get rid of the discriminative thinking as a way of understanding the world and seeing it as part of the world and then moving beyond it. Uh, the same is sort of true as you go through these various categories. They all follow from this notion of eliminating the discursive thinking part of ourselves as we try to investigate what's beyond discursive thinking. Now, the answer that we're going to focus on is his clarification. He says, additionally, the Prajnaparamita Sutras were taught to encourage the dialecticians of the Buddha's time 
to develop faith? And this is the answer that I'm more interested in. Part of the reason for that is that it's much more practical than trying to understand the original answer, which really would require a lot of meditative practice and experience with doctrinal texts and a lot of sort of philosophical and logical thinking to get to a conclusion. So, it brings up a question of what is faith in Buddhism? And the term that's often translated as faith, the Sanskrit term is uh, shraddha. And shraddha isn't really the same as the notion of faith that we have in sort of popular culture. Uh, something that's embodied in things like, for instance, uh, Hebrews 11 in the Bible when we say that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, etc. In Buddhism, Shraddha is more characterized by a developing of trust in the efficacy of the teachings and one's experience of them. And so this is kind of a different way maybe of thinking about faith. Um, it's not that we're asked to trust without any sort of proof or that the trust itself is a proof. It's that through the evidence that we see, we begin to develop trust and then this furthers our, furthers our faith in Buddhist teachings. And Nagarjuna, uh, and I should also say, it's associated with the first two elements of the Eightfold Path in some exegesis, the right view and right thought. And Nagarjuna tries to break it down into these four factors. So he says that faith consists of faith in the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the extinction of suffering, and the truth of the Eightfold Noble Path that leads to that cessation of suffering. The Three Jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, or Taking Refuge. Karma, in the sense of uh, the fact that things come about through causal connections to each other. And then the fourth one, Deeds and Fruit, is sort of understanding that big picture of having faith in the fact that the actions that we take and the intent that we have when we take them will actually play out based on the actions and the intent that we have when we do those things. And that's honestly a pretty practical way to think about faith, in my opinion. So he's saying that the purpose of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, which are very uh, hard to understand and very philosophical, is really to get us to understand and have faith in these four things, which I think is sort of interesting. Now, that's what the story that we're going to look at uh, look at is, is about. <clears throat> so with this, I'd like to say that faith is what allows us to, in a Buddhist context, is what allows us to move beyond our intellectual limitations. So there are things that we can't understand just because of our various predispositions, the faculties we have, our experience, etc. And so faith is a tool that allows you to sort of unfetter yourself from those things to be able to not have to understand all of those things in the deepest level of detail, to be able to live a good life, practice Buddhism, and then faith in turn develops your wisdom. And so it feeds back into your eventual ability to understand those abstruse texts. But at the time of the Buddha, the dialectical masters, as uh, Bhikshu Dharmamitra calls them, these were the people who were sort of going around having intellectual debates and they studied a lot of the sort of classics of the time, and they believed that the claims of any treatise that was set down could be demolished, all discourses could be devastated, all beliefs could be subverted, and that therefore there was no genuine dharmas or phenomena in general that anyone could have faith in. So in other words, they took a strict anti-faith position. Is, and that was a source to bottom? It's, uh, it's not necessarily limited to them. Um, the examples that are given are uh, Shrenika Vatsagotra and oh, okay. Satyaka Nirgrantha Putra, um, which I'm not sure of their particular schools. But the assumption is that they are they're non Buddhists. Right. So our story begins with. Mahakashtila. Sorry, it's a little difficult to pronounce. And he's the uncle of Shariputra, who is one of the Buddha's most famous disciples. And we know him, of course, from the Heart Sutra that we recite every week. And <clears throat> Shariputra's family were uh, the Brahmin caste, which puts them at the sort of top of the social hierarchy of the time. 
actually that puts them above the Kshatriyas, which are uh, Shakyamuni Buddha's family's uh, class. So keeping that in mind, these were uh, these members of this family were very well educated, and interestingly enough, must have been a lot of fun to live there. Mahakashtala liked to spend a lot of time debating his sister Shari, who became Shariputra's mother. And the thing is, he was a pretty clever guy, so he pretty much always won the debates. Until he was debating her one day, and he felt like he wasn't talking to his sister anymore. He just he thought that it felt like some wise sage was speaking through her mouth. And so, at this point, somehow he deduces and thinks to himself, this cannot be due to my sister's own power. It must be that she's pregnant with a wise man who's conveying his words to his mother's mouth. If before he's even born, he's already like this, what will he be like once he's born and grown? Well, is that because it's not possible for a woman to be intelligent? Well, there is probably the implication of that for the historical context. But it's also implied that he and his sister debated regularly, and she consistently lost. So, take that how you will. So he's surprised when she suddenly beats him, but he also, it's kind of described as he doesn't feel like it's his sister talking, like it sounds like somebody else to him. So anyway, and he is an arrogant and sort of prideful character, as we'll see. Because knowing this, immediately hurt his pride, and the first thing that he considered was, how can I become wiser than this baby who is not yet born? So he wanted to be able to top his nephew even before his nephew has been born. And so he sets off and he decides that he is going to travel to the south of India. And he's going to study the 18 great classics of the time. His goal is that when he returns, he's going to be more wise than whoever his nephew is. So he starts traveling, and so people start questioning him as they see him, right? Because he's left, he's become a brahmacharya, which is uh, now he is, this is sort of like a student, right? It's the idea behind this name. So as a brahmacharya, he's traveling, and people sort of see how he's dressed and how he's behaving. And people would ask him, what do you wish to obtain? Which of the classics are you trying to study, etc.? And he would always say, I wish to exhaustively study all of the 18 great classics. And they would say to him, well, that's ridiculous. You could spend your entire lifetime studying and still wouldn't even be able to know one. How much less would you be able to know them all? Well, he wasn't deterred by this. It just made him more upset because people are doubting him and he's the smartest guy around. So, he would think to himself, this, before my pride was hurt on account of being defeated by my sister, now yet again, I'm subjected to humiliation by these people. And so, spurred on by this, he made a vow. He vowed that he would not even take the time to trim his fingernails anymore, because he needed to exhaustively study all of the 18 classics. And uh, some things never change. People saw this guy, this Brahmacharan, wandering around with long nails, and so they started calling him the Brahmacharan Long Nails, <laughs> which is the name he is typically known as, uh, Durganaka in uh, Sanskrit. <laughs> and we'll call him Long Nails too, because Nagarjuna does. So, he studied for a long time, not even trimming his fingernails. In years past, Shariputra was born and he, you know, was reaching adulthood, and his uncle is off studying the classics. And he gets really good at debating. In fact, he's just going around challenging everybody to, debate, to debates, and he doesn't lose anymore, because he's so good at it. And the result, the result of this is that he's so good that the story characterizes it this way. By using the power of wisdom derived from all types of classical texts, by using all manner of satirical barbs, by maintaining that this is dharma or this is non-dharma, this is admissible or this is inadmissible, this is true or this is not true, this is existent or this is non-existent, this man was able to refute other dialectical positions. And this is my favorite part of the description. He was like a mighty crazed elephant 
which blocks and gores, kicks and tramples, and which none can bring under control. And for a modern analog, I think of the copious videos that we can find on social media of, you know, famous pundit debates undergraduate and owns them, uh, which is kind of a trend, that there were always people like this, even going back to the time of the Buddha, who are just wandering around as contrarians saying, debate me, debate me. And I don't feel like particularly the Brahmachar and Long Nails was so interested in the pursuit of knowledge so much as he wanted everyone to know how smart he was. Mm -hmm. And so he was challenging everybody to debates and taking whatever position it took for him to win. So, after he had ruthlessly defeated all of the dialecticians in debate in the area that he was staying in, in southern India, he decided to return to his birthplace, which is uh, Rajagraha, which we might recognize as a place that the Buddha and the Sangha often spent time around, and where Shariputra grew up. And when he showed up, he wanted to know what had happened to his nephew, to the child that his sister had had. <clears throat> and so he went around asking people. And there were several people who didn't really know, and then he finally came across somebody who could tell him. And the guy says, well, uh, yeah, this Shariputra, well, when he was eight years old, he mastered the 18 classical texts. <laughs> when he was 16, he defeated everybody in the region in debate. And then he met this man of the path from the Shakya clan that people called Gautama and became his disciple. Oh man, this is the worst thing that Long Nails has ever heard. <laughs> First of all, his nephew has way outshined him already. But even worse, now he's somebody else's disciple. He was so wise, he mastered all these texts at eight. He defeated everyone in debate at the time he was 16. Who is this guy whose disciple he is? And this was too much for him. Uh, he responded to this person saying, what sort of trick could he have used to deceive and induce one so intelligent as my nephew to shave his head and become a disciple? And so he sets off to go find this guy, the Buddha, and see what's going on. So when he shows up, there are a bunch of, uh, bunch of members of the Sangha gathered around, various monks who are there with the Buddha, and the Buddha's sitting and there's somebody fanning him. And as Long Nails approaches, he realizes it's Shariputra who's got the fan, and he's fanning the Buddha. And, and Shariputra had only ordained uh, about half a month earlier, so he's a very new member of the Sangha at the time. And he's there fanning the Buddha when his uncle walks up, which is probably even worse than just the story that he's heard. So, Long Nails goes up, he pays respect to the Buddha, and then he kind of goes off to the side to size him up. And really to psych himself up to get ready, because he's gonna he's gonna take it to him in debate, right? <laughs> and so he sits thinking to himself. He's really psyching himself up. He says, All treatises can be refuted, all discourses can be devastated, and all beliefs can be subverted, which was what they believed at the time. What is it in all of this that is the true character of the Dharmas? What is it that represents the ultimate meaning? What is it that constitutes the true nature? What are the characteristic features? And what is it that is not an inverted view? And he's just sitting there thinking this in his head, watching the Buddha from the distance. And then he continues ruminating. Resolving this quandary is like seeking to completely reach the far shores and plumb the depths of a great ocean. Even though one may search for a long time, one can't find a single dharma actually admissible to the mind. What dialectical path could he have used to win over my nephew? And sitting here like this, spinning his wheels, he finally decides to approach the Buddha. The text says, after he had cogitated like this, he said to the Buddha, Gautama, I do not accept any dharmas or any sort of phenomena or argumentation as being something that is real. The Buddha asks Long Nails, you're not accepting any dharmas, this view. Do you accept it or not? The Buddha's implicit meaning was, you've already swallowed the poison of false views, now get rid of this toxic influence. He said, the Buddha said, all dharmas, you say you don't accept them, but this poison of views, do you accept it or not? At this time, 
The Brahmachar in long nails was like a fine horse, which on merely seeing the shadow of the whip, immediately remembers to stay on the right track. The Brahmachar in long nails was also like this. The shadow of the whip of the Buddha's speech entered his mind. He immediately cast off his arrogance, was contrite, and lowered his head. He then thought, the Buddha has defeated me with a dilemma. If I say I accept this view, then this fallacy is obvious, and most everybody will be aware of it. Why did I say I don't accept any dharmas? If I now say, as for this view, I accept it, that would amount to a blatant error in discourse. It would be an obviously fallacious position, and most people would be aware of it. The alternative fallacious position is subtle, since not that many people will be aware of it as fallacious, all choose to accept that alternative. And having pondered thus, he finally replied to the Buddha, Gautama, this view that I don't accept any dharmas, I don't accept it either. The Buddha said to the Brahmacharin, if you don't accept your view that you don't accept any dharmas, then nothing is accepted. But in this regard, you're no different from anyone else in this congregation. What then is the point in presenting in a haughty and arrogant manner like this? The Brahmachar in long nails was unable to reply. He knew that he'd fallen into a fallacious position. He then felt respect for and faith in the Buddha's omniscience. He thought to himself, I did fall into a fallacious position, and yet the Bhagavan, the Buddha, did not reveal the fact that I had been defeated. He did not speak of right or wrong. He ignored it. The Buddha's mind is pliant. This is the ultimately pure stance. All rhetorical positions are extinguished in it. He has attained the extremely deep Dharma. This is a position which can be revered. He is supreme in the purity of his thought. Now, because the Buddha's speaking of Dharma had caused him to cut off his false views in the very place where he sat, he succeeded in distancing himself from the dust and leaving behind impurity. He achieved the purification of the Dharma eye with respect to all dharmas. In other words, he finally saw all the dharmas clearly for what they are through the power of his faith in the Buddhist teachings. When Shariputra heard this dialogue, remember he's still fanning the Buddha over the mm -hmm. side, he realized arhatship. In other words, he awakened spontaneously. This Brahmachar in long nails then left the home life and became a Shramana. He gained the realization of the mighty arhat. And he didn't gain it immediately, but the story is that shortly afterwards he also becomes awakened after he's joined the Buddha Sangha. And Nagarjuna concludes this section by saying that if the Brahmachar and Long Nails had not heard the spirit of the Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, which transcends the tetralemma or all of the possible logical options, and which is the truth corresponding to the ultimate meaning, he would not have developed even the faintest degree of faith how much the less would he have been able to achieve the fruition of the way of the renunciant? Thus, it was also because the Buddha wished to lead forth such great dialectical masters and other such people of sharp faculties that he set forth this Prajna Paramita Sutra. It's a fun story. <laughs> So thinking about this story, the obvious purpose behind it is to both explain why the Prajnaparamita texts were taught, but also to establish uh, faith as an important part of Buddhist practice, something that should be held in equal measure with the attempts to get into the nature of reality through these sort of dialectical techniques that we see in the Prajnaparamita. <clears throat> So one of our reflections on this is that the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is meant to lead the intellectually inclined to faith. And this is something that I think we should consider when we look at difficult texts like this and see all of these paradoxical statements and have a really hard time trying to make sense of them logically. There is an internal logic, but it's very difficult to understand. And part of the reason behind this is that it's showing us the pitfalls of over-intellectualizing things. And so, if this is the way that we're inclined, if you're like me, you like to read books all the time, you can't put books down, then probably what you need is a healthy dose of faith. Mm -hmm. So following from this, in Buddhism, faith is what frees us from obsessing over the things that we don't understand. 
So the reason that we have all of these devotional practices that we can participate in, all of the practices that are based on faith, all of the many texts that are based on faith that tell us about various Buddha lands for us to consider and visualize and imagine ourselves in and see ourselves as related to, is because there are limitations to what we're able to understand, but those are the things that sometimes bother us the most, and it's yet another source of dukkha. You can study the 18 classics, and all that it takes is the encounter with the right person who bests you in a debate, and then what was all that effort for? You still haven't developed your understanding anymore, unless you're really open to see in that moment that the conduct of the person that you're dealing with was much more important than what they said to you. And following from that, I think one of the more important messages in this, in this particular story is that what we do and how we do it are just as important as what we think and feel. The thing that really wins the Brahmacharan over is that when he talks to Shakyamuni Buddha, the Buddha doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm going to debate you or anything like this. He simply asks him a question about his beliefs and he lets uh, the Brahmacharan trap himself in his own set of views, right? His own insufficient understanding of the technique that he's trying to use and his feelings of self-assurance and his mastery. And so the thing that really strikes him is that the Buddha doesn't call him out as being wrong in front of everybody. He lets him, he lets him fall into a contradiction and work it out for himself. And then basically says, oh, interesting. So you're, you're like everybody else here then. Want to join up? <laughs> and of course, for him, that's exactly what he needed to see. He'd spent his whole lifetime now debating people, thinking that he was the master of the intellect. What he really needed to see was somebody who could offer him that sort of compassionate understanding instead of trying to fight back, try, trying to fight with him on his own terms, I should say. Well, with that, <clears throat> these are the, oh man, it messed up my spacing. <laughs> oh, I edited something at the last minute and it messed up it. my references. Aww. But uh, but yeah, so the first source that we have, uh, this is actually an online version of the first part of the Maha Prajnaparamita Shastra translated into English, which is a little bit of a rarity, I guess. Um, there's actually a lot of text there, and it's a very interesting resource to check out if you have time. It's all hyperlinked and very nice with definitions of terms in Sanskrit mm -hmm. and all Wisdom those Library. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it's from Wisdom Library. And then the second one is uh, actually this book from Bhikshu Dharma Mitra, which is just the stories that Nagarjuna uses mm -hmm. in that commentary. It's full of stories about many of the members of the Sangha and even a lot of sort of ancillary figures that you might not have ever heard of. Um, you think about the Lotus Sutra when they introduce uh, all these thousands of beings. Well, for the Prajnaparamita Sutra uh, commentary, Nagarjuna decided that he was going to tell you every one of their life stories. So there's a lot of information about the characters if you're interested. And there's a lot of exciting lore. Um, this book is pretty thick, but it's uh, 130 stories from the, from the commentary. So most of them are actually short and it's bilingual. So it's really half this. <laughs> Is Chinese the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because this is this is based on the on the Daji Dulun, which, um, as far as I know, we only have in the Chinese translation from Kumarajiva. So with that, um, yes, this is the regarder of the cries of the animals, um, many-headed canon fox. Um, Sensei, is there anything that you would like to add? I, I was just going to make a comment that sometimes, it, I, I think you did a great job to begin with, so just, just to let you know that. And just, people may have been confused when we hear the term Dharma, you may just think about it being a Buddhist term, but in fact, it's the term that's used with any Vedic teaching. So the term Dharma came from the Vedas, not from Buddhism originally. So the Dharmas that, that Long Nails was arguing was Vedic dharmas, the mm. dharmas that Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching were Buddhist dharmas. So we say the Buddha Dharma to differentiate 
that it could, there could also be the Jain Dharma. Mm-hmm. There could also be the Sikh Dharma. <laughs> there, it's it's the the Indic continent term mm-hmm. for the for the teachings. Right, right, and that's one of the reasons it's kind of hard to find a satisfactory just definition mm-hmm. of what we're talking about in terms of dharmas uh, in Buddhist texts because it was already enough of a part of the culture that people were using this terminology all the time. So it was a pretty commonplace word. Yeah. So, So, but you did a great job. Thank you.